Hello, and welcome to this open topography tutorial on how to perform on-demand 3D differencing within the open topography portal. Today I will walk you through how to do 3D differencing, and then I will discuss the methodology behind the differencing. High resolution topography is a powerful tool for imaging and understanding processes active at the Earth's surface. When an area is imaged more than once, we can perform 3D differencing to detect 3D landscape changes. The 3D differencing tool measures lateral translation of the ground surface. Therefore, it is best applied to earthquakes. However, it can also capture other processes such as sand dune migration and landslide movement. These are the 3D differencing results applied to the 2016 magnitude 7 earthquake in Kumamoto, Japan. This was a surface rupturing earthquake which occurred along the Kushu Island of southwestern Japan. In the topographic differencing hillshade on the left, you can see that the earthquake ruptured two faults that cut through these agricultural fields. On the right, you see the 3D differencing results. In this case, horizontal arrows show the horizontal displacements and the colors show the vertical displacements. So in the bottom of this plot, you see horizontal movement to the southwest, as well as upward movement. And then there's an abrupt change in uh, arrow direction. The arrows suddenly go to the northeast and show downward movement. So this is the location of one of the faults. The location of the other fault is a little bit more cryptic, but you see there's a sharp change in uh, amplitude or magnitude of the displacements to the northeast, and this is the location of the second fault. So these maps of 3D displacement are important for determining earthquake size, the sense of motion, the amount of slip along the fault plane, and ultimately constraining seismic hazard. So how can we perform this 3D differencing? Let's go to open topography. First, you want to go to opentopography.org, and we recommend that you set up an account. With an account, you can see a dashboard of past jobs, process larger jobs, and have access to a larger set of processing tools. You then go to data here, where you can see the available data sets. So here is the data page. These red dots are the location of high resolution topography available from open topography. So we're gonna go to Japan. And as we zoom in, the dots become polygons that show the extent of the available data sets. So this here is the Kumamoto data set that we discussed earlier. You can zoom in. You see here that we already have two polygons. So you can draw a box around that area, for example, here, and then scroll down. So here we see that we have uh, point clouds available for the pre-Kumamoto earthquake, and then a second point cloud for the post-Kumamoto earthquake. Further, we see that there's actually two different differencing tools, vertical differencing and 3D differencing. Because today, this video is discussing 3D differencing. We are going to uh, look at the 3D differencing tool. So we actually can select the 3D differencing with either the pre or the post data set and ultimately we'll get the same result. So we'll click here. So here is the 3D differencing page. So here you can see that we have two different data sets. We scroll down, we see that the green data set here is the reference. By convention set in the literature, the reference data set is the post event data set or the second of the two LIDAR data sets to be acquired. The compare data set is the pre event or the first of the two data sets to be acquired. Here you can switch the reference and compare data sets by checking or unchecking this box. However, typically it's actually not a good idea to change the reference and compare data sets. 
So you then want to draw a box around the area that you want to process. Example here, and then you scroll down and you see coordinates and classification. So here you can see the coordinates of this box and that this job has uh, about 30 million points. Topography sets a constraint on the number of points that can be in any individual job. Uh, so if you're told that your box is too big, then you'll want to select a smaller box. Here you have the option to choose uh, return classification, ground, unclassified, or vegetation. So we can unclick the unclassified and vegetation. We see that we go from 30 million points to less than half a million points. So it turns out that dealing with so few points here is actually not enough to perform the 3D differencing. So it's important that we use the full LiDAR data set. A digital elevation model is generated for you in the differencing, so you can set some of the parameters here. One of the most important parameters in 3D differencing is the window size. It's essentially the resolution of the 3D displacements. And I'll discuss this in more detail later, but here you can see that we make a recommendation of the window size that is based on the point density of the lower resolution data sets. However, you can change this parameter, say, to be 40 meters, but we'll keep it at the recommended value of 51. You scroll down, you have more additional choices uh, to set for the DEM, or of course you can leave these values to the default choices. And then down here, ultimately want to enter a job title, so you could say Kumamoto 3D Differencing, and then enter your email, and you'll want to press submit. So this here shows the progression of your job, which is being processed at San Diego Supercomputer. The first step is to query both the reference and compare data sets. Then the next step is to perform a 10 to make the digital elevation model for both the reference and compare. And then the final step is to do the 3D differencing. So here are the 3D differencing job results. You can see the job ID, the reference and compare data sets, the title, and then the duration of the processing. So you have options here to download the data, the two point clouds that were used in the 3D differencing, as well as a zip file which contains the set of differencing products. So then below we have uh, visualizations of the different products from the differencing. So here is a plot that shows the arrows and dots that represent the horizontal and vertical displacements. You can click on any of these figures and see them in uh, full resolution. Then we can zoom down and we see raster plots that show the different um, deformation. So here we see the X displacement, the X rotation, Y displacement, Y rotation, and then the Z displacement and the Z rotation. Scrolling, scrolling down even more, we can see the topographic hill shades that were produced from the reference and the compare data sets. So that is 3D differencing on open topography. So now I will discuss how the 3D differencing is performed. The first step is to window the point cloud data. So this figure here shows point cloud data. The blue is the compare or the pre-event data, and the red is the reference or the post-event data. And so the first step is to window um, both of these data sets, as you can see here, um, the data that is bolded. And this black point here is called the core point, and it's at the center of the boxes or the windows, and it's used typically as the reference for the measured displacement. The reference data set 
typically has this buffer relative to the compare data set. That's because when we're doing the 3D differencing, we iteratively shift the compare data set until it aligns with the reference data set. And so the compare or the shifted compare data set must align with the reference. So we need this extra buffer. So after the windowing, the differencing is done using the iterative closest point algorithm. And that's uh, illustrated here for the set of benched topography. Here you see the blue compare data that is iteratively moved and shifted until it aligns with the red or post event data. The alignment is done with a rigid deformation. So this includes a rotation and a translation. Example here, we take the undeformed point cloud, apply a rotation and then a translation and this generates the deformed point cloud. So here are the steps to the 3D differencing. First step is the user decides they want to do 3D differencing. So they select a region with overlapping data sets and then they choose to perform 3D change detection. They're offered a range of processing options. First is window size and open topography makes a suggestion based on the point density of the lower, lower resolution data set. User can choose to use uh, the full set of point classifications or just a subset, for example, the ground classified points and open topography imposes a processing limit on the size of the job. Then the 3D change detection happens and um, the first step in this is to window the point cloud data set and this is done using last tile and then we apply a, the iterative closest point algorithm to calculate the 3D displacements and rotations. And the final step is to present the results so the user can download geotiffs of the 3D displacements and rotations and they can also view graphics of the uh, 3D deformation within the open topography portal. So now I will discuss how open topography makes recommendation of the ideal window size. Call here the window size is this dimension of the compare data set. Um, and for airborne LIDAR data, this length here is typically a few tens of meters. So we make recommendations of the ideal window size based on synthetic testing with multiple data sets hosted by open topography. So to do the synthetic testing, we take an individual data set, for example, Indiana or Utah, split the data set in half and offset one of the halves of the data set. You then use the iterative closest point algorithm to remeasure the displacements and calculate the error, which is the difference between the measured displacement and the input displacement. So these both plots show displacement error versus window size. And the blue and red points represent the horizontal displacements and the black points are the vertical. This so blue line here is the 20 centimeter error threshold. So we, the ideal window size is the window size where the error is below this 20 centimeter error threshold. This first plot represents 2012 data from Indiana with a point density of 0 0.6 points per meter squared. So as you see here, the error decreases with increasing window size, but never goes below this error threshold. This plot here is for Utah. It's 2014 data, has a point density of eight points per meter squared. You see here that the error also decreases with increasing window size, but it goes below our 20 centimeter error threshold at a window size of about 25 meters. So here are the results applied to 13 data sets. And we did some artificial thinning of the data sets to increase the range of point density. This plot shows window size when the error goes beneath the 20 centimeter threshold 
versus point density. We fit an exponential curve to this graph and we actually use this uh, top dashed line which represents the two sigma spread to make the recommendation of the ideal window size in open topography. So many of the points lie either close or below this, um, this dashed line, so we'll be able to get a good result in the open, to open topography differencing. This graph shows that when point density is greater than about two points per meter squared, a good window size is on the order of 40 to 50 meters. However, when the point density decreases below two points per meter squared, we typically require a larger window size. So there's a lot of scatter. Likely this represents two features. One is the error within the point cloud, which is going to vary between different data sets and is typically not reported in the metadata. And second, these differences also represent landscape characteristics. For example, the Himes snow on data have a much lower window size than the Himes snow off data. So this shows the results with just the ground classified points. So we still have this uh, fairly exponential relationship. We see that when the point density is above 0.5 points per meter squared, we can use a window size of about 30 meters. And when the point density is less than 0.5 points per meter squared, this is the case where we need a larger window size. So this shows that in many cases, we can actually typically use a smaller window size when using just the ground classified points. Of course, the exception is over dense forests or areas with high vegetation where the point density of just the ground classified points is less than 0.5 points per meter squared. So there's two flavors of the iterative closest point algorithm. One is the point to point. Uh, in this, the algorithm aligns the compare points with the reference points. So here we see each of the compare points has a line drawn between it and the closest reference point. And so the iterative closest point algorithm will uh, work to shorten these lines by aligning the two data sets. In the point to plane algorithm, the compare points are aligned with the reference surface. Mathematically, this is done by considering only the misalignment in the direction that is normal to the surface. So we compare the differencing results from three different algorithms. So we're looking in this region here, we have these agricultural fields as well as these town and forested landscapes. These blue lines show the faults, so we would expect there to be large displacements across the faults. This plot here shows flight lines. One of the big sources of error in airborne LIDAR data is an offset between the different flight lines. So all these, are, these are not ideal to be in the differencing data sets. They reflect er issues with the data and not with the differencing algorithm. So this here shows the LIBICP point to plane algorithm. This was developed by Geiger et al. in 2012. This ends up being our preferred algorithm. You can see the large displacements occur across the faults. We do have some of these displacements which are aligned in the direction of the flight line. So likely noise due to error in the uh, LIDAR data. This is the LIBICP point-to-point -point algorithm, and here's the PDAL point-to-point -point algorithm. In both of these cases, we see that the displacements actually correlate with the change in landscape, particularly from the agricultural lands to the town slash forested areas. This is unlikely to have occurred in the earthquake, so in the end, we prefer the LIBICP point to plane algorithm. 
Thank you for watching our video, and we hope you enjoy doing 3D topographic differencing on open topography.